Welcome to module two for the course on women, youth empowerment in agriculture. Module two, it's about examining women and youth as concept for community and agricultural development. This module introduces you to the concept and issues related to women and youth as important factors for community and agricultural development. It highlights the vulnerability and challenges faced by these groups and the corresponding influence on their supply of labor and accessing growth enhancing inputs such as capital. At the end of this module, we expect you, the participants, to be knowledgeable on the issues related to mainstreaming gender and promoting women and youth for community and agricultural development. Africa has so much promise. Africa is a young continent. It is home to some of the world's fastest growing economies and offers an exciting frontier for businesses looking for growth and new markets. However, the issue of gender inequality and youth marginalization is limiting Africa's potential. Promoting gender inequality is one of the most effective ways to drive inclusive growth and reduce poverty. The African Union declared the year 2015 as the year of women's empowerment and development towards Africa's agenda 2063. And this is a very positive sign that African leaders could have declared the year 2015 as a year for women's empowerment. We must remove any barriers that keep women, boys and girls from realizing their full potential and their rights for equal opportunity and treatment, say, said the African Union statement. That was an appreciation of the role of women in Africa. Women in Africa who have always been active in agriculture, trade, and other economic pursuits. African women are guardians of children's welfare and have explicit responsibility to provide for them materially. The women are the household managers, provide food, nutrition, water, health, education, and family planning. This places heavy burdens on women despite developments such as improved agricultural technologies, availability of contraception and changes in women's socioeconomic status, which are important to contribute to improving the lives of women. However, despite these adv advances, women's economic capabilities, and in particular, the ability to manage family welfare have been threatened. Women in Africa grow 80% of the food and yet are allowed to own just a few proportion of the land. It is often more difficult for women to gain access to information and technology, as well as other resources needed in agriculture, particularly credit. More importantly, agricultural extension and formal financial institutions are biased towards a male clientele against the women who are the leading producers. So as a consequence, women end up working twice as long as men, almost 15 to eight hours a day, as some studies have shown, but often earn only 10% as much as men. With such workloads, women often age prematurely. The constraints women face from the private sphere of the household to the public sphere of politics are therefore a major detriment to the continent's economic development and inclusive growth process. So while women are disadvantaged, the youths are marginalized and youths are very, very significant in Africa's demography. The population of Africa has grown rapidly over the past century. The total population of the continent as of 2020 was estimated at about 1.3 billion Africans with a population growth rate of more than 2.5% per year. The total fertility rate, that is the best per woman for Sub-Saharan Africa is 4.7 as of 2018, the highest in the world, according to the World Bank. The most populous African country is Nigeria with over 206 million inhabitants as of 2020 with a growth rate of 2.6% per year. If this trend continues, Nigeria's population is estimated to reach a billion people by year 2100, surpassing China in population density, given the smaller land size of Nigeria relative to China. This therefore calls for urgent policy actions and efforts from the government of Nigeria and other African countries, as well as continental-based institutions to respond to this emerging 
crisis. Young people, whether boys and girls, constitute therefore a large and rapidly growing proportion of the African population. However, the younger people in, in Africa's population face a myriad of challenges, from high unemployment to various forms of poverty, education, inequality, lack of access to mentorship programs, and many others which hinder the youth from bettering their lives. These young people live in a rapidly changing world faced with many pressures. In fact, the young people in Africa on the whole experiencing discomforting confusion, disquieting irritations and perplexities, as well as adjustment problems as a result of rapid so social change, which these youths face. For example, there is an increase in drug and alcohol use among Africa's youth. There is also teenage pregnancies and school dropouts, urbanization, modernization and Western influence have come to erode traditional African values. The family system in Africa is losing ground rapidly and the indigenous systems of education have largely disappeared. In fact, more important and interestingly, the current socioeconomic challenges in Africa block the progress of the African youth. In fact, the Offitting Post, an authoritative American newspaper, concludes gloomingly on the African youth as follows. Too many young people in Africa today cannot look forward to, a leading, to leading an independent and fulfilling life. Their future remains precarious. Young people have been hit hard by crisis. For a large number of them, the transition from education to employment has become more difficult. Too many are at risk of poverty or exclusion. Many feel that their views are taken for granted and their best use is being political stooges. There is a serious risk that a large number will drift away from society. This is unacceptable. We need to do much more to support young people and youth work can play a vital role in this, said the Huffington Post. Now, what comes to mind is the changing demography. Here we look at the youth bulge and the gains or the dividends that can accrue from an African, from Africa's growing population and youth bulge. Are there some potential benefits that may come from a growing youth population? Africa has witnessed a steady and significant growth in its youth population over the last decades. With 70% of the population in Africa aged below 30 years, median age of 18 years, and 20, 226 million people aged between 20, 15 and 24 years, Africa therefore has the youngest population in the world. The number of working age youth in Africa is unprecedented. The African Union, for example, estimates that on average, 29 million additional young people in Africa will turn 16 years every year between now and the year 2030. And according to the World Economic Forum, the working age population in Africa is expected to grow by close to 70%. So the working age population in Africa is expected to grow by close to 70%. Approximately 450 million people between the year 2015 and 2035. The African region will have 362 million young people aged between 15 and 24 years by the year 2050. This is a tall order for the continent. Today, in most sub-Saharan African countries, the youth aged between 15 and 29 represents more than 40% of the adult population. This phenomenon is known as the youth bulge. As shown in the figure that we, are, that we shall present shortly, Africa's population bulge will surpass that of Asia by the year 2050. The youthfulness of Africa's population while presenting challenges could be a good opportunity, however, for the continent if youth employment and the demographic dividend are well addressed. By the year 2030, the increase in labor supply could create the first demographic dividend and boost Africa's annual growth of GDP per capita by up to half a percentage point, assuming constant output per worker. In other words, by the year 2030, this demographic dividend could contribute 10 to 15% of Africa's growth, dom, dom, growth, gross domestic product growth. If the demographic dividend is to have broad benefits for the continent, 
It is important, therefore, for governments in the continent to invest in youth entrepreneurship and technolo technological innovation to seize the opportunity in the coming decades. Here we have the figure demonstrating the African youth bulge between 1950 to the year 2100. From 1950, in blue, you, ha you have the growth of the Asian population. In black, you have the growth of the African population. And in gray, you have the rest of the world. By 2010, by 2010, you will observe that Africa's population is growing faster than Asia's population. And by the year 2100, the gap opens wider. While African population is going up, is going up, that of Asia is trending downwards. And the rest of the world is trending upwards in correlation with that of Africa, which therefore demonstrates that Africa will be a significant driver of global world population and not Asia. Because we can see that by the year 2050, Asia's population begins to, to drop. And here in the figure below, we see the population of Africa, Europe, Latin America, North America, Southern America, Southeast Asia, China, and India. By the year 2050, all the subcontinents in the world, the population is trending downward. It's only Africa that has an explosion of population between the year 2050 and 2100, which gives us an indication that Africa's population is going to grow and Africa is going to have the largest workforce from 2030, aged between 15 and 64. So not only the young population, even the adult population of Africa is going to surpass that of many other subcontinents. This population explosion has challenges and benefits and those benefits are referred to as dividends. So, what are the demographic dividends? The typical policy response in other transition countries like China, South Korea, Singapore, when they also experienced a, a youth bulge, was to prepare the youthful supply of labor. They had a policy agenda in which the conventional approach to dealing with youth bulge was to make young people job ready. The idea is that young people's skills or human capital needs to be increased to enhance their productivity in the labor market. The World Bank in its 2007 report emphasized both skills upgrading and changing the institutional setting for improving the economic outcomes of young people. The World Bank lays out a clear policy agenda by focusing on five key life transitions if countries want to tap in and benefit from the demographic dividend that comes out from the, from the youth bulge. One, learning. We have to improve on learning, work. We have to improve on the work conditions, health. We have to improve on the health conditions, family. Policy has to address intra-family relationships and welfare and for citizenship and citizenship in, in, form, in terms of acceptance, uh, freedom of expression, and general welfare of belonging by the citizens, which will reduce political strife and civil conflicts. In fact, the World Bank lays out clear policy agenda which addressed learning, work, health, family, and citizenship. Three lenses are used by the World Bank to focus on these key life transitions. Opportunities, the lens for capability, and giving people a second chance. How can that happen? Basic skills and access to secondary and tertiary education, for example, are needed to create opportunities while capabilities to make the right decisions for seizing opportunities can be enhanced through better information, access to credit, and other factors. On the other hand, when outcomes are negative, for example, poor decisions lead to low levels of education or exposure to communicable diseases, young adults may need access to services that can help them to restart or have a second chance to restart their economic and personal lives. So while women and youths are facing these challenges, there is the inherent issue of gender. Next, let's look at gender and development for agriculture. 
then from there, we can be able to tease out the policy measures that will be required to enhance the contribution of women and youth in agriculture and overall economic development. Africa's population of men, women, boys and girls call for differentiated policy concerns, calls for differentiated policy concerns. But when we talk of gender, what do we mean by the way? Gender is a complex factor that is a part of social, cultural, economic and political context. Gender refers to socially constructed differences between men and women, whereas the, we typically misconstrue or make a mistake to refer to gender as sex. Sex simply refers to biological differences between men and women. Gender, on the other hand, is a socially constructed differences between men and women. Being socially constructed, gender differences vary depending on age, marital status, religion, ethnicity, culture, race, class or caste, etc. Sexual differences vary little across these variables. In taking into account of gender, development practitioners therefore are looking at disparities that exist in male and female rights, disparities that exist in responsibilities, disparities that exist in access and control over resources, disparities that exist in the voice at the household level, the community level, and the national levels. So why is gender relevant for development? Men and women have different priorities. Men and women have different constraints. And men and women have different preferences with respect to development and can contribute to and be affected differently by development projects and campaigning interventions, especially in the agricultural sector. So to enhance effectiveness, these considerations must be addressed in all programs and projects. If such considerations, that is considerations of men and women having different priorities, different constraints, different priorities, if such considerations are not addressed thoughtfully and adequately, these interventions can lead not only to inefficient and unsustainable results, but may also exacerbate existing inequalities and inequities. Understanding gender issues, therefore, can enable projects and programs to take account of these and build in capacity to deal with inequitable impacts and to ensure sustainability. So women's rights are protected by many international instruments and laws across the globe. The best known is the Convention for Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW a UN treaty which was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1979. It is an optional protocol which was later developed, setting out a mechanism by which states will be held accountable to the treaty. Following the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, there have been subsequent international declarations and pledges which have been used as benchmarks to measure progress in relation to specific women's issues. These include number one, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action in 1995, the famous Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, as well as the Melanin Development Goals of 2001 and the Sustainable Development Goals of 2015, which include very, very strongly gender considerations in almost half of the clauses. Here in Africa, the African Union too has taken its responsibility in its African Union's protocol on the rights of women. The African continent has demonstrated commitment to promoting gender equality and the empowerment of women through various instruments. For example, you have the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, also known as the Banjul Charter, which is an international human rights instrument which promotes and protects human rights and basic freedoms in the African continent. That charter, can be exploited to see the protection it accords to women and youth with respect to human rights. Almost all African Union member states have ratified the Banjul uh, Charter, the, the African Union Protocol, as well as the Banjul Charter. Most countries have ratified the African Union's protocol on the rights of women in Africa. Other milestones with respect to protecting women's rights include the African Union's declaration of 2010 to 2020 as the African Women's Decade. So 
most of this is very, very important. So the priorities which have been accorded to women is because of women's primordial role. Women play an important role in African agriculture because most of Africa's food is produced by women. In a society that revolves around men and women are the force of the economy, though they remain largely ignored, women in Africa do most work, but are not valued the same as men. Women who work in agriculture do not generally receive training. These disparities demonstrate that the potential of women in Africa isn't fully recognized. Although women are responsible for the majority of production, they are not able to influence agricultural policies, which affects their activities. So gender roles are not only hindering the potential of women in Africa, but they also hinder Africa's potential. These women deal with harmful pesticides, for example, and rudimentary tools, and also suffer considerable abuses at home. So it is important that the significant, a significant proportion of Africa's population must be empowered if the country has to reap a dividend out of its population. Strongly important is because the economy of Africa could be improved by involving more women in agriculture, policy changes itself, or by investing in those who do agricultural work. Harnessing Africa's demographic dividend is very much dependent on the full inclusion of women across the overlapping political, social, and economic spheres. Advances women equality can deliver a significant growth dividend. According to the McKinsey Global Institute, if Africa steps up its efforts to close gender gaps, it can secure a substantial growth dividend in the process. Accelerating progress toward parity, equality, could boost African economies by equivalent of 10% of their collective gross domestic, domestic products by the year 2025. And, if, and in a realistic best in region scenario, as demonstrated by the McKinsey analysis, in which the progress of each country in Africa matches the country in the region that has shown most progress towards gender parity, if that happens, the continent could add $316 billion to GDP in the period right up to 2025. In summary, therefore, gender-inclusive government facilitation of the growth of agriculture, as well as small and medium enterprises will be integral to harvesting the potentials of a demographic dividend in the continent, with women promoted as full economic citizens in the inclusive growth process. It is therefore important that policymakers identify the roles of gender. And here we are talking about gender mainstreaming. What are the elements and levels of gender mainstreaming for policy programs? If Africa wants to ensure that a significant proportion of its population, almost 50% of its population being women and being importantly for the agricultural sector, there must be gender mainstreaming. What is gender mainstreaming? Mainstreaming a gender perspective is the process of assessing the implications of women and men of any planned action, including legislation, policies, or programs in any area and at all levels. It is a strategy for making the concerns and experiences of women, as well as of men, an integral part of the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of policies and programs in all political, economic, and societal affairs, so that women and men benefit equally and inequality is not perpetuated. The ultimate goal of the gender mainstreaming is to achieve gender equality, says the United Nations Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, that defined the concept of gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming has been embraced internationally, including the African Union and its member countries, as a strategy towards realizing gender equality. Gender mainstreaming involves the integration of a gender perspective into the preparation, design, implementation, monitoring, evaluation of policies, preparation, design, implementation, monitoring, evaluation of programs and projects, as well as regulatory measures and spending programs with a view to promoting equality between women and men and combating discrimination. 
Gender mainstreaming requires both integrating the gender perspective to the content of the different policies and addressing the issue of representation of women and men in the given policy area. Both dimensions, women and men, gender representation and gender responsive content need to be taken into consideration in all spheres of policy making progress. The figure below provides us an overview of the different components of gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming on the top far left will require political commitment as well as a legal framework. Governments have to demonstrate their political commitment and countries have to establish legal framework. At the continental, continental level, we have the African Union Charter. This moves into different di into dimensions, two key dimensions, the equal representation of women and men, uh, as well as gender perspective in the content of policies. For all of this to happen, we must have the right conditions, choose the appropriate methods and tools, and expect important, interesting results. The appropriate conditions will require clean, clear implementation plan, adequate structures, enough resources, accountability mechanisms, knowledge generation, gender expertise, as well as stakeholders involvement in the production of policies, programs, and projects. Right methods have to use. We have to put on our gender lens and implore gender analysis, a gender audit, gender awareness raising methodology, gender budgeting, gender equality training, gender evaluation, gender impact assessment, gender indicators, gender monitoring, gender planning, okay? And gender procurement, as well as gender statistics. Gender sensitive stakeholder consultation shall be required, as well as institutional transformation with sex disaggregated data. What are the results you expect after going through gender mainstreaming strategy? You have better policy making, which takes into account the differences, the aspirations of men, women, boys and girls. You have better functioning institutions and you have a more effective policy making process. Therefore, in order to mainstream gender, particularly in an agriculture related policy or program project, one needs to take into account A, who are the stakeholders of a policy program or project? B, what kind of consultations need to take place and with what groups? C, have exhaustive ways being sought to include the perspectives of all groups of male and female stakeholders. And D, we are must ask ourselves, what are the expected impacts, positive or negative, of a policy or a program on each group of stakeholders? And finally, have the rights of all groups being, who are involved being addressed? So in order to mainstream gender, especially in agriculture, we must ask and answer these five key questions. What must we therefore do to engender African agriculture? Gender differences matter in agricultural production in various farming systems. <clears throat> where the ownership and management of farms and natural resources by men and women are often defined by culturally specific gender roles. In Africa, as we've said over and over, women make up a large part of the agricultural labor. In 2015, they represented 40% of the agricultural labor force. Closing the gender gap could increase yields in women-owned farms by almost 30%. And this could raise total agricultural output by almost 40% for most countries in the continent. Therefore, women are important in agriculture and agriculture is important to women, but women own fewer productive assets of land, livestock, human capital. Women have less access to inputs of seeds, fertilizer, labor, and finance. And women have challenges accessing services, whether it is training or financial insurance or health insurance than men. To further complicate things, equal access to resources does not guarantee equal rights for women farmers. Women need specialized agricultural training, childcare, and customized support 
to ease their double workload as farmers and caregivers. Women's limited access to productive resources have negative impacts on their agricultural productivity and consequently the incomes they can generate from agriculture. In other words, income generated by women is typically lower from their farms as compared to that of men. In sub-Saharan Africa, for example, levels of agricultural productivity for male farmers are 20 to 30% lower compared to that of male farmers. Levels of agricultural productivity for female farmers are almost 30% lower compared to that of male farmers because of what? The gender gaps regarding access to resources. So there is all justification that we must engender African agriculture. In other ways, we must take into consideration the gender phenomena. The right resources could help rural women maximize economic opportunities, increase productivity, improve food security, education, and healthcare, since women tend to reinvest in their households. Harnessing Africa's demographic is very much dependent on the full inclusion of women across the overlapping political, social, and economic spheres. And these deeper level changes are messy, political and revolve around the deliberate reforming of entrenched power structures. Such systems level transformation goes far deeper than the quotas, percentages, and targets characterizing the international development industry. And it's instead found in the less quantifiable struggles for increased agency, women's voice, and power throughout the private and political realms. Hence, gender equality in agriculture and food sector must be an explicit goal. It must be an explicit goal in policy making. It must be an explicit goal in projects and program designs. The strategy to include actions based on thoughtful gender analysis that aim to result in positive gender outcomes should include the following. First, expand women's access to land and rural finance. This will call for providing women with greater access to land, finance, and production inputs, which is critical to closing the productivity gap between men and women. Again, microfinance institutions and other financial service providers with presence in rural areas should play a key role in supporting women farmers. Next, we should link women to agricultural value chains. Women are from production all the way to processing and marketing. They must be helped, they must be assisted to make traditional farming more productive and commercially viable. Inclusive involvement of women in the value chain will offer work opportunities for women and men of the farm in the forms of processing and value addition. Again, we need to improve rural women's access to training and information. Why? because knowledge of farming techniques is critical to productivity. However, women farmers have inadequate access to agricultural extension and training services. It is also important that training and agricultural technologies are accessible and adapted to rural women's needs and constraints. What do we therefore need to do to facilitate women and youth participation in agriculture? Because they are a perfect catalyst for an agricultural revolution. We must take into, into consideration the potentials, capabilities of women and youth, men, women, boys and girls. Rural youth in particular are the future of the agricultural sector. According to the, to the FAO of the United Nations, the average age of the African farmer today is 60 years. 60% of the population is under the age of 24 years. The youths are therefore the future of agriculture. There is thus every need to develop techniques that makes farming more attractive and rewarding. Youth empowerment has long been identified in, in Asia and in other continents as a catalytic tool for promoting youth employment in agriculture. However, many factors still hinder the expansion of youth empowerment to reach its, its intended goal. This includes the lack of necessary infrastructure, lack of strong youth empowerment policies, limited youth empowerment activities, poor involvement of youth in the decision-making processes of each youth empowerment program, and poor participation in youth programs. It is imperative 
for the public and private sectors to work together to develop strategies that will support youth empowerment initiatives. The youth become empowered in agriculture related programs when they, are, they have effective policies that protect and drive their initiatives. They are included in decision-making processes. Their voices are heard and honored. Their opinions and ideas are implemented. They are given the opportunity to take ownership of the programs. They are given opportunity to design solutions to their problems. A diverse pool of peers is participating in these programs. They are provided with the tools and resources to participate in each programs. And communication is done in a language that youth easily understand empowering you, women and youth to participate fully in agricultural development and contributing to the national economic group will also require, in addition, to facilitate land acquisition and accessibility for agricultural investment, facilitate acquisition and accessibility for financing for financial resources, facilitate acquisition of agricultural inputs, machinery and other necessary support services, facilitate development and use of irrigation infrastructure, enhance marketing and agricultural products, enhance mitigation and adaptation to climate change and variability, promote technical and, and entrepreneurial skills, facilitate linkage between youth and other youth agriculture support initiatives, promote decent work in the agricultural sector, as well as mainstream cross-cutting issues in youth involved in the agricultural sector. As rural youth aspire to become agripreneurs with attempts to create wealth from the agricultural sector, in, in that case, they are linked along the entire value chain from production to transformation and marketing. The following recommendations can be exploited to facilitate Africa's youth, especially the boys and girls, to be attracted to agripreneurship. Governments have to earmark and decentralize a significant part of their budget to the agricultural sector, of which at least 5% should be allocated to agricultural activities for rural youth and young women. Governments and development partners will be expected to put the needs and preoccupations of the youth at the center of their development policies. And this should be done in a participatory manner with the rural youth involvement and that they include advocacy and lobby in their development program in agriculture. Governments should review their youth policies and propose measures which are adapted to rural life, guarantee the rights of rural youth and provide them with a better and more decent life. Governments and their funding institutions and partners should design a sufficient percentage of the national budget to launch policies empowering young people in rural areas. When we talk of young people, we refer to boys and girls. This empowerment should enable them to promote productive activities in the field of family farming, small scale farming and fisheries and actively include rural youths in the drafting, implementation and evaluation of policies and budgets. Governments should implement policies which are adapted to young rural people's needs and to the different cultural, social and economic backgrounds of these boys and girls in order to reduce inequalities in rural areas and guarantee an access to land for the young rural people, give them future prospects in farming and value people's identities. Again, governments with the help of the private sector should use the media and modern technology to promote agriculture among youth and to provide information and examples of sustainable agricultural activities. Governments and development partners should establish a rural youth day. Pharmacy organizations put into place rural youth sections within national, regional, and continental platforms. More importantly, our agricultural education systems and research institutions should be improved to better respond to the needs of young people willing to make their living in agriculture. Interestingly, national agricultural policies should be youth friendly, promote small scale farming, and protect young farmers from the adverse effects of corporate farming. Again, a higher percentage of national agricultural budgets should be dedicated to improve youth access to agricultural activities. Overall, pharmacy organizations should promote and facilitate young rural people's participation in their own structures, both men and women, 
and should consider the need for gender equity in order for them to understand the issues affecting rural youth and involve themselves actively in defending their social, political, and economic rights. Men, women, boys and girls play an important role in Africa's agriculture. Therefore, Africa's policymakers must mainstream gender, must mainstream youth in policymaking, in programs and projects. Gender has to be engendered in African agriculture so that the significant proportion of Africa's population is tapped into for Africa's agricultural development. The gains and benefits that come from a population explosion has to be tapped so that the population explosion is turned into an advantage. In other words, decent job and opportunities have to be created in the agricultural sector. Skills set for men, women, boys and girls has to be enhanced so that they play a meaningful role in Africa's agricultural development. Thank you.